Good evening. I'm, I'm Johnny Carson, and um, I think I should tell you that I've, uh, I've given a lifetime to comedy. And the, uh, the next 90 minutes is going to seem like a lifetime to you. <laughs> I used to joke about it in front of audiences when they would ask, what's it like being on The Tonight Show? I said, it's like there's a doorknob on the front of your TV, and you open it, and you get inside the TV. That's what it's like when you're sitting next to Johnny Carson. I mean, he was a TV star. He was an American TV star, and I don't think there has been a bigger star. But he didn't do it by acting. He, he did it by just being himself. It was real. Everything he said was real, whether he was talking about divorces or drinking or whatever it might be, it really happened to him. And I thought that was really cool. I don't think anybody was watching Johnny Carson to rate how his material was. Do you know what I mean? You liked him. You liked that man so much, and you went with him. Everybody kind of watched the same thing, and we all shared that same experience. I don't know anyone who didn't watch Johnny Carson, so we all, the next day, had the same things to talk about. This is a guy who was as familiar as a bedtime story. Certainly the most recognizable person in the United States. You know, for day in, day out, Mr. Reliable, oh, I can't wait to hear what Johnny's going to say about this event. It doesn't hurt to be one of the funniest guys around and be able to be quick and improv. And he, he would, he would, he always made the guests look good. Johnny brought something solidly, broadly, hilariously accessible that just no one else uh, did. Johnny was a tough, aggressive killer. That's how he got to be Johnny Carson. Personally, I was often intimidated by, by Johnny. He was standoffish. There's no question about it. He was uh, aloof. But he was so big a star that he couldn't shine himself brightly for everybody. I mean, most people don't live under that kind of uh, magnifying glass like that. He had that kind of personality that when the light went on, he could do it all. When the light went off, he, a lot of times he wanted to put the covers over his head and go to bed. To me, he's the Citizen Kane of comedy, where I met different writers from different eras, and we all had the same story, which is we knew a little bit about him, but not very much, and you piece it together and you try to get a picture, but it's still not the full picture. I don't know what his rosebud is. Carson is the great American Sphinx. He was on view like a monument, daily, nightly. There he was, Carson right there before us. And what did we really know? 47 stories beneath the Earth's surface in Hutchison, Kansas, encased in a cocoon of salt 400 feet thick, can be found the legacy of Johnny Carson. It is a time capsule of popular American culture in the last third of the 20th century. More than 4,000 hours of tape documenting the franchise he hosted for 30 years, The Tonight Show. What Carson was unable to reveal about himself in his private life, he disclosed before a nightly television audience of 15 million people. One looking for evidence will find it on these tapes. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Johnny. I grew up in the Midwest, kind of a normal, I guess what you'd call normal upbringing, you know, the part of the country. Uh, my, my folks were supportive in what I wanted to do. Did you always know what you wanted to do? Oh, yeah. From oh, the yeah. very beginning? Oh, sure. How old? Well, I must have been about 12, 13 years old. I knew I wanted to, to entertain. You liked the attention? Oh, sure. But why? Why you? I mean, why at age 12 or 13? Because I was in a play or something, and I got up, and I did something, and people laughed. And all of a sudden, you say, hey, that sounds pretty good. So it makes you the center of attention. Yes, but why did you want the attention? Hmm? Why did you want the attention? Why did I want the attention? Because I was shy. Ah. Because I was shy. Now that sounds like a, a ambivalence, right? No. On not stage, any. you see, when you're on stage in front of an audience, you are kind of in control. When you're off of the stage or in a situation where there are a lot of people, you're not in control. And I felt awkward. So I went into show business thinking it would give me a little more, I could overcome that shyness. Where do you think the shyness emanated from? I, I bought it in Chicago. 
good to talk to you. I think everyone gets a little homesick, especially if you have fond memories of your early years, and I do. You want to visit old, familiar places and return for at least a moment to an era that gave you a direction in your life. It's a lovely countryside, isn't it? I think autumn is probably the most beautiful season in Nebraska. Most of us know it as the Cornhusker State. I simply call it home. I certainly felt, having come from Nebraska, he never lost that innocence that he projected to the audience of being a lot like them, even though he was this star. I'm a down-to-earth fella. Just want you to know that. As a matter of fact, today I got out the old hammock, went out, climbed in, laid there for a couple hours sipping a lemonade. Then I went back in. My two butlers were getting tired holding up the hammock. <laughs> And I think he had a certain moral compass, kind of a middle America compass, which had certain fairness and certain rules. One of the reasons he was so successful for so long is that people, they saw that. That's my mother and father. Right, this, please stand up and hang with the <laughs> He was a gentle man. He was a very loving man. He was a great role model for Johnny because I think all of Johnny's tenderness and thoughtfulness and sensitivity came from his father. But Ruth had a wild sense of humor. She had an off-the-wall sense of humor. And it was her humor, I think, that Johnny picked up. There's an old saying about the, you know, the Midwestern guy, he loved his wife so much, he almost told her, you know, that, you know, you know. And I think he came from that staunch, we love you, son, we don't have to tell you, you know. I mean, that's the sense I get. I could be totally off the wall, but he never lost sight of where he came from, and I think that's pretty important. John William Carson was born in Corning, Iowa on October 23, 1925. When he was eight, the family moved here to Norfolk, Nebraska, where Father Kit Carson worked for the local power company. Johnny had a younger brother, Dick, and an older sister, Catherine, who was the favorite of Mother Ruth Carson. Mrs. Carson later said that she didn't like boys, they were dirty and nasty and not pleasant. As the middle child, young John felt lacking of the affection received by his siblings, especially Sister Catherine. In later years, he would joke about the lengths to which he'd go to get his mother's attention. Hi, how you doing? You're Wayne, right? I met you before. <laughs> Hasn't changed too much, outside of the interior decoration. Dad, I heard your dad put in that fireplace, right? My dad put that fireplace in? and I used to sit with a deck of cards. I did magic when I was about your age. Every place in the house, I had a deck of cards in my hand. Drive my mother crazy. My mother would be upstairs in the bathroom. Now, you may not believe this, but I would go into the bathroom and say, take a card. <laughs> Johnny liked to be in control. Being a performer allowed him to do that. That was what he did. As a kid, he would drive people crazy with his endless jokes, just going on and on, always performing, always learning, always developing his character. Which, which was anybody but Johnny Carson. I took up magic uh, when I was young yes. because I was somewhat shy and within myself, and I thought well, that would be a good way to go to parties. Yeah. You know, I read those ads, yeah. you know, be and the life girls. of the party and get girls. Yeah. Mainly I got it, uh, did it to get girls. <laughs> Neither one worked well, but lots of people do that. They'd like to get up and perform. You can be the center of attention without being yourself as such. At age 13, Johnny sent away for a book of magic by Professor Lewis Hoffman. It quickly became his all-consuming interest. I think magic probably saved Johnny's emotional life as a kid because apparently it was not the warmest of communicative families. He called himself the Great Carsoni. At his first paid engagement, he earned $3 performing at the local Rotary Club. Even towards the end of his life, Johnny would always say his favorite birthday gift that he'd ever, that he'd ever received was when his mother surprised him with this beautiful cloth that covered the table that he stood behind when he performed magic. 
he learned the craft of illusion, of becoming bigger, of projecting and misdirecting and, and giving you a, a greater sense of something that maybe wasn't entirely always him. His true confidence was born with magic. And if you think about it, he was the most confident guy on television you ever saw. Do you like coins? Yeah. Okay, I'll show you how to make a coin disappear. All right? All right, and we got, you see this? That's a quarter, right? Yeah. Now, if I take it and hold it, and I give it to you, would you hold it for me? Yeah. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. Now, watch very carefully. Okay, here it is, and you hold it. <laughs> yeah. It's right over here, in your ear. In addition to magic, Johnny had another life-shaping influence growing up. It happened every Sunday night at 7 o'clock. And you used to look at the radio. You didn't just listen. You used to look at the radio and listen. I was doing that in Lowell, Massachusetts, and we were both listening and not even knowing it by, you know, osmosis. We were studying Jack Benny. For years and years and years, I've been Johnny Carson's idol. Now, you've said it, haven't you? Many times. Many Absolutely. times. Then all of a sudden, the whole thing switched, and Johnny Carson became my idol. And you want to know something? It's not nearly as much fun this way. <laughs> Benny was his idol. Jack Benny was. And he wasn't afraid of silence. And I think he learned that from Jack Benny. Let time go by. Let the audience see how you're taking in what's happening, which is what he did beautifully. Now, you may not, you know, you may not realize this, yeah. but every move you make, your, your delivery, every little inflection that you have is exactly the way I work, and I don't think it's fair. <laughs> I love the pauses and milking every moment. And there was nobody better than Johnny with that, you know, with just, just a look and a face and not doing anything, but, but doing a lot, you know? Well, they make jokes about you drinking, like I make jokes about Ed. Can I? That's may I. May I, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> you were dangling a participle, and I just wanted to... Well, I'll wear a long coat, and nobody will notice it. In 1946, after a stint in the Navy, Johnny entered the University of Nebraska and used his college years to further develop as an entertainer. For spending money, he parked his car in front of his Phi Gamma Delta fraternity and charged the brothers 25 cents an hour to use it as a necking parlor. He fell in love with his magic show assistant. Jody Walcott was tiny, acrobatic, and could squeeze into the black box when he sawed her in two. She became the first Mrs. Carson. Reminds me of my old girlfriend back in Nebraska, Gina Statutory. <laughs> <laughs> Name was Gina Statutory, and uh, she went to Lincoln High, and she was voted Miss Lincoln because uh, every guy in school took a shot at her in the balcony. <laughs> Upon graduation, he went to work at Nebraska's most powerful radio station, WOW. He played records, read the news, weather and sports, and filled the rest of the time with his patter. For extra cash, he performed magic as the great Carsoni and also did ventriloquism. The whole world should see this. We all have to begin somewhere. I have to find And this is idea. Mr. Carson at a very oh. early age in show business with his little dummy. What do you think his name was? You won't guess. Eddie. Eddie. <laughs> so nothing has really changed. Nothing's changed. <laughs> this is WOW TV, Channel 6, Omaha, Nebraska. Johnny Carson was present in August of 1949 when the first television station in a five state area went on the air. Those 1,500 people in Omaha who had televisions invited their friends over to watch a test pattern broadcast four hours every day. And we were all doing radio at the time, of course. And uh, it was an announcement put up, beginning Monday, John Carson will do a one-hour television show. That was my, my notice. So we went up and tried to pull something together. And we had a little set in the corner. And we went on the air, Monday at 4. 
We hope a good many of you are enjoying Christmas with your families today. And uh, if you've exchanged presents already, probably had a very nice Christmas dinner. And that uh, you'll sit down and enjoy uh, the Christmas with the gang here at WOW-TV. My name's Johnny Carson. And there was no money in television in those days, but nobody cared because you were, you were learning what it was all about. After less than two years in Omaha, Johnny felt ready to move up in the world. By now, he also had three young boys to support. Through a college friend, he secured an announcing job at the CBS affiliate in Los Angeles, KNXT. He had his first nationwide exposure when he uttered the words, this is the CBS television network. He set the goal to have a show of his own within a year. Carson Seller! He was not a comfortable guy in the beginning. He was what I would call stiff-necked. He was very thin, and he had this this kind of, you know, posture that was almost a little like a bird. He just seemed not to be able to relax easily. And uh, where do you live, Mr. Bailey? I'm a native Californian. A native Californian? Yes, sir. Well, that means that you must have lived here for at least two years then, huh? <laughs> He was a man who, when people met him early in his career, said that guy is like a piano wire about to snap. Johnny was hard to get close to. So if you could talk to him about the show and creative ideas, it was great. He was loose and funny. and But outside of that, there was no personal relationship. A fan of Carson's cellar included comedian Red Skelton, who later hired Carson as a writer on his television show. Johnny's big break occurred on August 18, 1954, when he stood in for Red. The Red Skelton Review. My name is Johnny Carson. This afternoon, a dress rehearsal is just about oh, an hour and a half ago. Red uh, slipped during one of the sketches and injured himself. And uh, the injury is not uh, really too serious, but uh, Red's doctor advised him that it wouldn't be too best to do the show today. Personally, I think Red's doctor should do the show. You taught me a lot. I stole a lot from you. No, you didn't. Oh, yes, I did. No, no, it's like the students. They say, uh, the, you know, Johnny was with you at one time, you helped him get started. I said, no, nobody helps you get started. If you've got talent, they can put you behind a brick wall, you'll come through, you know? Oh, that's nice. So that's what you have. <laughs> Weeks after Carson hosted for Red Skelton, the NBC network premiered Tonight, starring Steve Allen. It would mark the beginning of the most successful franchise in television history. And I think it really became one of the great American institutions of television that has been very hard for other countries to imitate. Whatever it is about the American performer, it seems to be, you know, we like to invent ourselves. And uh, these guys are self-invented characters, and they stand out in that way. The Johnny Carson Show, starring Johnny Carson. In June of 1955, CBS premiered The Johnny Carson Show. The network believed it possessed a talent that had grown up in the new medium of television. Thank you very much and good evening. I'm Johnny Carson. Now, the reason I say that each week is because my kids love to stay up and watch television. So every Thursday night, my wife turns on the set. I come out, I say, hello, I'm Johnny Carson. My kids say, oh, it's only daddy, let's go to bed. In praising Carson, one critic said, he had a singular youthful charm and an impish twinkle in the eye. CBS publicity portrayed Johnny as the perfect family man. They realized they had a great love for each other, but maybe they were outgrowing each other, and she probably felt the need to become a Hollywood wife of some sort, whatever that meant, you know. Even though he wasn't like a superstar by any means, they had to learn how to be not Nebraskan anymore. He was under stress, and the only way he could get out from stress was to have a drink. And Johnny was a cheap drunk. You give him a drink and a half, and he's gone. He was a vodka guy back in the, in the early days, and he could knock him back. And he and his wife, I mean, they famously fought 
uh, Jody, Jody and uh, Johnny were, were the battling Carsons. Now, another thing I want to point out that I'm going to call my real wife Jody, who uh, we live out in Encino. I don't want you to think that I'm just calling some girl that we pay to act like my wife. I wouldn't pay anyone to act like my wife. <laughs> the network could never settle on an identity for The Johnny Carson Show. Seven directors and eight writers came and went. CBS canceled the program after 39 weeks. Said Johnny, I found myself and my material subjected to the opinion of businessmen. Carson would never forgive or forget. He really felt he had come to the end of his career because he was felt he was on a downhill slide. Nobody was booking him. Nobody was asking him to come anywhere uh, or perform anywhere. And he was a little bit on the depressed side. Well, everything was going wrong. His personal life was a disaster. The marriage was falling apart. He had a wife and three kids he had to take care of. He lost his Johnny Carson show. That had failed. He tried a nightclub act in Bakersfield. That failed. Out of work, no money, bad marriage. At the end of his rope, Carson hired new managers who got him an audition in New York for a game show on the third-ranked network, ABC. Who do you trust? Here's the star of our show, Johnny Carson. Welcome to Who Do You Trust? We have another tie to break on the show. It was a game show, but it was really just an excuse, like, like Groucho's You Bet Your Life, to interact with the contestants. He had an ability to get laughs out of them without belittling them in any way, you know, or condescending to them. Matter of fact, I met him on a boat trip in the Paris sewers. <laughs> you met him on a boat trip through the Paris sewers? It's kind of like the Tunnel of Love, though. No, what do you mean? What, <laughs> what kind of boat was it? Is it a motorboat or what? No, as a matter of fact, they rode it. Probably one of the rules down there, don't make any waves, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Any girl that brings home a husband from the sewers can't be all bad. Huh? <laughs> and uh, Ed, who's first to uh, yes, lead We're all set. We have Lola Mason from right here in Manhattan. For who do you trust? Johnny called Dad in for the interview. They talked for five minutes. Johnny was looking out the window. Nothing like, what, what do you have to offer? Or, you know, how would this work? Dad left. He never in a million years thought he was going to get the job. And a couple days later, he got the call. You're, you're it. And I was selling vegetable gadgets on a corner and Johnny came by and he saw me in pain a terrible thorn was lodged in my foot and Johnny pulled the thorn out I licked his face and we've been together ever since days after Johnny became a host of who do you trust Jack Parr replaced Steve Allen as the permanent host of the tonight show a job he would keep for five years before calling it quits when, when critics say, uh, well, Parr doesn't do anything, he doesn't sing, he doesn't dance, he doesn't, what does he do? I think that they're being a little unkind. You could mention, if you were fair, that I'm always on time. And the key to Jack, to me, on television was danger. He was like a grenade, you know, waiting to go off. But I think Parr was extremely well-respected at the time, I and mean, he really took the show to another level, because people who watched the show then, it became like a cult under him. You had to watch Jack Parr to see what he was gonna say. It was, it was provocative, and you know, he's taking on you know, political characters for the first time, making jokes about politicians. I, it, he, he, he set it to a new level. Why'd you give up The Tonight Show? You, you, were, you, were, you were a dynamite hit. Uh, you could have stayed on, you, you could have been sitting here today. Well, you needed the work. <laughs> Jody loved Johnny and was totally devoted to him, but this man was incapable of that kind of intimacy and that kind of relationship. It just was not going to work. His marriage was to his career. The marriage broke up because she got jealous and thought he was seeing other women, and he wasn't home a lot, and after the show, why didn't he come back to be with her and the boys? And there was all this tension. Johnny's friends dismissed Jody by saying he'd outgrown her, but she was the one who sought the divorce. He began to date Joanne Copeland, who had a budding career of her own in television. She had ambitions for Johnny he didn't have for himself. It was Joanne who directed NBC executives to Carson 
as a replacement for the departing Jack Parr. But when they offered him the job, Johnny turned them down. Joanne was very powerful behind the throne. And I don't know if Johnny was totally unaware of her power and manipulation, but she was very active in controlling the show more than I think he knew. He probably wouldn't have been goaded into doing it had she not pushed him as hard as she did. And he said, Joe, two reasons I turned it down. One, I don't think I can fill those shoes. Jack Parr, Steve Allen, those are big shoes to fill. And I'm also afraid of losing you because I know these shows. They are all consuming. And I said to him, you can't lose me. As long as we work as a team and we do this together, I won't feel left behind. It is no great secret, and I'm sure ABC won't mind if I mention this. Uh, <laughs> what can they do to me if I do? <laughs> Fire me today? But I go over to, uh, on The Tonight Show on NBC starting October the 1st as the host of that show, and Ed goes with me as the announcer on the show, so I'm going to mention that. <laughs> We all went to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and stayed at a big hotel on the beach, Ed McMahon, Johnny, and myself. We went to a Polynesian restaurant one night. All of us had about three or four Mai Tais, and then got up on the stage and uh, put on hula skirts with me in the middle, Johnny on the left, and Ed McMahon on the right, and did a hula lesson uh, in front of the patrons who probably wondered who the hell we were. In only two weeks, they hammered out the format that would endure for the next 30 years. From Studio 6B at Rockefeller Center, The Tonight Show, with its new host, premiered October 1st, 1962. So as we're walking down, I said, how do you see my role down here tonight? And he said, Ed, I don't even know how I see my own role. Let's just go down and entertain the hell out of them. kind of an emotional thing for me because I've known about this show for a long time. And the newspapers and the magazines, and I've probably been interviewed 150 times in the last nine months since I've known about this. And you get kind of charged up. I don't mean to be maudlin about it, but I know that tonight a lot of people, a lot of my friends are watching all over the country. And I only have one feeling as I, I stand here knowing that so many people are watching. I want my man there. <laughs> You know, there was a mixed feeling about Carson because Carson didn't feel like the intellectual heft of, of, a, of a par. And when he went on the air, there was great expectations that he would disappoint. They are referring to me as the new king of nighttime television, and I think that's just a little, really too much. Prince, yes. <laughs> we were doing nine hours of television a week, an hour and 45 minutes a night, five nights a week, live. That is a tremendous burden. Johnny did not click immediately on The Tonight Show. It's an interesting historic fact that almost seems unbelievable now. And it took Johnny several weeks to loosen up. And I remember backstage, people saying, this guy isn't making it. And it was chilling and strange to hear this and see this. He knew he could do a monologue without any trouble. But I know he feared sitting down because of that off-camera problem with talking to people in an easy way. There were unseen chords of inhibition in Johnny that were making it rough for him in, in, in real life. Um, everybody's a comic at a party. Because this guy last year, I remember, first he got out and he put his wife's hat on. And, you know, he got a few laughs. Then he went over and he took her high heels and he put the high heels on. And pretty soon he was, you know, walking around with her purse. And he got screams. The only trouble was he left the party early like that, and his wife hasn't heard from him since. <laughs> Ruth Carson called herself Johnny's toughest critic. She gave her son only a passing grade. I wasn't sure that John was the type for it, she told an interviewer. 
When Jack Parr had the show, there was so much controversy. John is not controversial. She would always find a way to deflate the helium from any high moment in his soaring career. Now you're talking about why the guy becomes a comedian. Couldn't get a compliment out of his mother. And I, on the other hand, my mother thought I was the best one no matter what, what I did. And maybe that's why I'm not as good a comedian as I'd like to be. I think there's some trauma probably in, in a comedian's background or upbringing that this is the way we, we compensate for it. I don't doubt that within every single performer, there's some part that, that is hoping to get the um, approval that they didn't get somewhere else in their life. Mine specifically, and it's awkward, is from my dog. <laughs> the Jack Parr program was quite controversial. Why did you uh, change the format? What was your reason for that? Um, I think shows that have gone in just for controversy to bring on uh, two people with opposing views uh, is very easy night after night. It's easier to do that kind of a show than it is to get laughs. Once he clicked onto the show, got those first laughs, realized he could ad lib as well as any of the guests, it was smooth sailing from that point on. It's very clear. Our love is here to stay. Not for a year. But forever and today. Carson was a cool customer. He was Marshall McLuhan's prototype. The cool medium, this was the coolest performer that medium would ever know, and thus would last longer, because he burned cool. Television is something where you want to unwind, you want to feel almost like it's a narcotic, and the performers that simulate that effect the, the most are the ones that succeed. And exactly what Johnny was doing was saying, I'm not going to be hot on a cool media. And it was an amazing observation to make on yourself that early on. But our love is here. Oh, he said, our love is here. I just said, our love is here. Play that spread. Our love is here to do what? Stay. I have my dog Muffin here. It's a little uh, Yorkshire Terrier, and she's seated in the lap of my wife Joanne. <laughs> Johnny and Joanne intended to keep their 1963 marriage a private affair. But the event became a national news story. Though host of The Tonight Show for less than a year, he had become one of the most famous people in America. You really do lose a lot of your personal freedom in a position like you have. I think you have to give up uh, a certain amount of your freedom, of your privacy, uh, in this business. It's a funny thing, it's a paradox. When you're first starting, that's what you want. Right. You want to be well known, you want to be successful, and Part of being successful, I suppose, in the entertainment business is being recognized and people coming up to you. And then after a while, you realize that you pay a certain amount for that, especially with children, if you have kids and you go someplace. I remember once we went to ice skating at Rockefeller Center, and I thought, gee, that would be fun. It turned out that it wasn't fun at all. Johnny wanted them to be kept away from the limelight, considering what happened on The Tonight Show. I mean, he got very, very visual. We could no longer take the kids to a movie. We could no longer do anything public. Everything had to be private. Johnny was the best read person I've ever known. You could not bring up an article, and certainly not a book, 
that he hadn't read. He had an enormous desire to be up on everything. Would you welcome, please, to Carson's firing line, William F. Buckley, the unmellowed and unbowed Gore Vidal. Would you welcome Mr. Norman Mailer. Would you welcome, please, Dr. Carl Sagan. Would you please welcome the Apollo 13 team, James Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigert. He had the entire culture at his doorstep. Whatever was going on, not in the world, but in America, eventually showed up sitting across from him at the desk. <laughs> <laughs> Did I ever tell you, Wendy, I told you this? I used to fight. Did you know that in the Navy? And I had about nine fights in the Navy. Is that right? Well, you must have been pretty good because I don't see no marks on you. Nothing. Well, I don't see many marks on you either. Well, I'm pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Throughout the years, Johnny Carson and The Tonight Show captured the national zeitgeist. 1969 ended with the marriage of novelty singer Tiny Tim to Miss Vicky. 45 million Americans tuned in, 85% of all television viewers. It remains the highest rated program in late night history. Well, I can't think of any better toast than a very simple one to wish you both uh, health and great happiness in your marriage. Tiny Tim getting married on the show, that was huge. You know, I was in high school at the time, and it was, it was the classic thing of what happened on The Tonight Show, everybody talked about. Hi, I'm Dick Cavett, and my guests tonight are Jack Benny, Bill Cosby, and former heavyweight champion of the world, the remarkable Joe Frazier. Join us. When a new show came out, oh, is this the show that's going to dethrone Johnny Carson? And they would get tons of publicity, and people would watch for a few weeks, and eventually the pace of it, or trying to put a monologue together, would get to them, and it would fall by the wayside. Whenever a Cabot show was canceled, which gave him several opportunities to do this, he would uh, have me on the next Monday, and he would say, uh, we're hoping the next one works, or it's going to be Armed Forces Radio for Richard. <laughs> In the end, he put out a better product across the board, and it was because he was smart enough to know how to give room to funny people or to engaging people and, and let them shine. I really think, Johnny, that you hosting the show tonight really is kind of dull. Uh, You're just... only as good as your guests. <laughs> he had the perfect barometer in his head of when to go and when to stay out. He could save you if the show needed it, or he could let you do your thing. His ego could let you do your thing. Did you hear the one about the woman goes to the dentist? To have the tooth out? Yeah. yeah. And he looks in her mouth, he says, that tooth will have to come out. She says, I'd rather have a baby. He says, make up your mind, I gotta adjust the chair. Did you ever hear that? <laughs> he made you the star of your segment. And there are others who just use it to just draw the attention to themselves. He had the confidence and the skill. He didn't need to do it. Do you use coupons and all that, or look for the specials? I do use some coupons, yes. <laughs> yes, I have a Sanka coupon right now that's worth 40 cents. <laughs> Johnny Carson was the best straight man ever. He knew where you were going. He knew when to come in and say, how fat was she? He knew when not to say it. No, my, well, my wedding night was a disaster. You know that. A well, lot of I... men smoke after they make love. Edgar smoked during. Now that's. <laughs> Ask me for a light. You think that's nice? <laughs> I say, get it yourself on the dashboard. What's the matter? It was an immediate connection. You knew you were bringing your little gift to him of a joke, and you knew he was going to open it and love it. <laughs> what do the rest of your family do? They are all chemists. <laughs> You could see his joy and his love of, of your comedy. If he thought you were good, I mean, he would, he'd be like a little kid just waiting for the next little, you know, uh, candy cane or something you'd throw at him, you know? <laughs> He's a silly kid. He's just really a silly kid. I really love you. I really love you. Well, you know, you keep I saying... I mean, I really love you. I know. You know what I mean? <laughs> Really, really is, uh... and I don't fall in love with guys, you know what I mean? I'm pretty tough myself. <laughs> and every once in a while, a beauty comes along. And... He was the best purveyor of spontaneous comedy material than anybody in the world. My grandfather was a purveyor of herring. If your life depended on coming up right now with the German word for exhaust pipe, could you do it? Unschnicken <laughs> muffler. 
But the biggest accolade you could heap upon yourself was to be a guest on the show and break Johnny up. Uh, the number of people have sat in this chair and said, I, I only did it because it was important to the script. And of course, I never would have shed my clothes otherwise for 14 days in front of the crew. Um, and they only shot for 10. Right. But uh... He genuinely laughed. He would double over and laugh at a performer. You like this? I, yeah, I like part of it. Yeah. <laughs> You know, if you said something that was a non sequitur, he'd let it lay there until the audience would get it. He, he was a, had master timing. Not a previews, with the regular audience. And right. I watched it play, I sat in the back, and I was real happy because I got, I told you to get down off that bed! <laughs> because I, I saw it play. It's like a chemical reaction. It generated this warmth and excitement that came right through the screen. Just seeing those people be funny on their own telling the exact same story would not be nearly as entertaining as seeing Johnny entertained by those people. So that's magic. On the job for nearly a decade, Johnny Carson's popularity continued to soar. But his toughest judge remained skeptical. In a Time Magazine cover story, a reporter sat with Ruth Carson as she watched her son's monologue. When he had finished, she said, that wasn't funny then got up and left the room. Publicly to do that to your son? Unfortunately, it says a lot about Ruth Carson. It was not a surprise to me. It was to Johnny, because to be on the top of the heap, to be the host of such a prestigious show like The Tonight Show, he thought she'd be proud of him. <laughs> I remember them on Guam. <laughs> <laughs> you girls go right ahead. Don't mind him. Could I, could I do it a couple of minutes? No! No! no. Just no, give me a break, I'm so lonely. <laughs> he was always on the hunt. I, went, I used to tell him, how about you get one of those pith helmets and a rifle and go looking for women? You know, he was, he was, always, on, he was always searching and, and scored pretty good, if I may say so. I'm sure. There were females. Um, I didn't know about him. I didn't want to know about him. Johnny had a right to live his life the way that was best for him, and I knew he would never embarrass me. It's not being magnanimous. It is being realistic in what I was dealing with. And I understood it very clearly. How did he happen to hire you? Um, by <laughs> just on the regular way. You mean his regular way? I don't think I ever called him Johnny. I always called him Boss. And uh, it just seemed more comfortable that way. And uh, he called me Legs. <laughs> I think there was a mutual trust and a mutual respect, and I think he felt I was kind of normal, <laughs> that I didn't have any hidden agendas, that I was honest, what he saw is what he got, and I told it like it was. He had affairs, and Joanne was apparently aware of it. I don't think ever at peace with it. I, I think to some degree it became tit for tat towards the end, and I think that's kind of how it all came apart. In 1970, Joanne charged Johnny with cruel and inhuman treatment, abandonment, and adultery. In her divorce settlement, she received a one-time payment of $260,000 and $75,000 a year from then on. It just occurred to me, crazy thought this afternoon, when you're in a romantic mood, and you're trying to make out, whose records do you put on? I think Johnny probably could have made a living, absolutely could have made a living as a drummer. Amazing. I think that's how, that's how good he was. He told me later that was the best way to relax, put on the earphones and play. He could do things with a drumstick with his left hand that I can't do, or anybody. And he said, don't you know where that comes from? 
He said, from years of coin manipulations, when I did my magic act. Johnny was able to be by himself and enjoy his own particular company. He didn't have to have an entourage like Frank Sinatra had. Johnny was never lonesome. He was a loner. In other words, he could spend time with himself, whether driving or flying or just reading. You think he's a loving father? I mean, I interviewed his kids, and they said what it was like. People would say, oh, Johnny Carson is your father. Isn't that great? Well, Johnny would just come home and go in his room and play the drums or solitaire and had very little to do with his children. It's sad to me that he not only was aware that his boys thought him so lacking as a loving father, but that I think some part of himself believed it and uh, felt as though he'd let them down. Ricky was part of my my little group, and uh, he said, "Guys, talk. I wish I could get along with my dad as well as I get along with you." In that instant, it revealed to me that maybe they had a sort of a not an easy relationship. The first day of May, 1972, be hereby declared Johnny Carson Day in the city of Los Angeles. Good heavens. I thank you for that nice warm hand, as Burt Reynolds recently said. <laughs> Johnny began a new chapter when he moved The Tonight Show to Los Angeles. The film and television capital offered a bigger pool of celebrity guests. And he was of Los Angeles. He was a star of that magnitude, a television star that equaled the magnitude of movie stars. Once Johnny moved The Tonight Show to Burbank, he was no longer the prince. He was the king. That's 10 years on the job. But there was power. He felt it. Thank you. You really should stop applauding, because you'll give me a big head. And uh, no, then my crown won't fit anymore. <laughs> A creature of habit, Johnny adhered to a strict daily routine throughout his career. Exactly at 10 o'clock, every day, the phone would ring. He would ask me for the figures on the ratings on the show. What did I think of the show last night? Well, let me check who's on tonight, Fred. What time do you want me for rehearsal? Tell the writers that I read something in the paper this morning about so-and-so and politics. They ought to work on that. And then also, I think he liked the fact that he could drive a car anywhere he wanted, and nobody knew that this was Johnny Carson driving around. And so he was able to kind of soak up a lot of things and have a little more freedom that he did not have in New York. I remember one time when Johnny came in in the morning, I said, uh, do you remember who was on the show last night? And he said, uh-uh. <laughs> you know, because he was always working towards the next one. I mean, you did not have a chance to breathe. Tonight show. You know, he started out as a writer. He was a writer for Red Skelton, and he was perfectly capable of writing for himself, although when you're doing a show day after day, you don't want that responsibility. That's it. That's a monologue. It's officially yeah. monologue. All right, let's get it to Johnny. But there was a time when there was a writer's strike, I think, in the 80s, where he wrote the whole show for several weeks just by reading the papers, and he just he came up with it all on his own. So he was quite brilliant. <laughs> He didn't have an actual desk. He worked off a coffee table. So I'd lay out all the writer's material on the couch, and he would go through it so quickly. He would just check off yes, yes, no, no, and just mark the ones he wanted. The phone rang. Uh, Richard, I think you're capable of a little better monologue than this. Never did that again. But boy, did he spot it fast. Good judge of material. Second standby playback. He said when he went through the curtain, it was a performance. I would be backstage with him and he'd be nervous as a cat for every show. He'd be pacing back and forth, smoking an unfiltered Paul Mall, checking himself, doing all his normal fidgets with the knot in the tie. And um, but he'd come through the curtain and he was suddenly Johnny Carson before 20 million people in bedrooms and 500 people in the audience. Three, two, 
two, one, music tape. The curtains don't just part, they kind of fly open, and out comes Johnny, you know, with that attitude, with a glint in his eye, bigger than life itself. And it was the coronation of the king over and over and over again. It was like a show business cathedral. And Johnny was the king. And he entered and he got his royal greeting every time. Look, you don't, you don't have to stop. This is America. You have the right to worship. <laughs> I guess Johnny was to comedy what Walter Cronkite was to news, probably as trusted by America as Walter Cronkite was. My dad would always say the same thing. Let's just watch the monologue. We'll watch a little bit of the monologue. I'm laughing and my father's laughing. And how, much, how often can you watch something with your father, you know? Can, he crossed generations, I think. What was it today? The other day before yesterday, it was 105. It's cooled off. It was 103 today. And it was, it was, it was hot today. Very nice. So hot today, I saw a sparrow pick up his worm with a potholder. I learned from Johnny just from watching him that putting a monologue together is a bit like putting a newspaper together. You open with the big story of the day. Everybody's talking about X, so your opening joke is about X, and then as you move through the newspaper, you get into politics, sports, the weather. I mean, I think everybody from Jon Stewart to everybody that does kind of a funny version of the news really is doing a version of Johnny's monologue. <laughs> Do you know the price of meat is so high <laughs> that Oscar Meyer, Oscar Meyer, just had his wiener appraised? Johnny Carson has a great rhythm, great timing. Monologues today, when you write a joke, it sounds like a Johnny Carson joke. You have to do an impression of Johnny Carson, or someone will bust you on it. Like that's so Carson, what you're doing there. And you know, I think he's the he set the bar. You see, people get that mixed up. There is, of course, is Saddam Hussein, who is the president and leader of Iraq. There is King Hussein, the King Hussein of Jordan. Now, maybe we could just put them all in a Hussein asylum. <laughs> just as Mark Twain had commented on the topics and affairs of his day, Johnny was the one who had the definitive jokes about news events of our day. And actually, uh, I mean, he was like a Mark Twain, uh, an electronic Mark Twain or Will Rogers. It's the Vietnam flu. It's a strange bug. It drags on for years and goes away just two weeks before election. He could change people's outlook on, on politics overnight. So he had this enormous power over the airwaves. It is commonly assumed in Washington that once somebody reaches the point where you use them in your monologue, mm -hmm. they are through. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight's monologue is, uh, <laughs> is dedicated to President Nixon. I've got a monologue that just won't quit. <laughs> the truth of it is, is when he went at Nixon, it was exactly the right time to do it. He had perfect pitch. He knew where the audience was at all times. You never knew Johnny's politics. Johnny would come out and equally make fun of everybody and never question anybody's patriotism. It was always about what they said or did. In fact, in 30 years, you'd be hard pressed to guess who Johnny ever voted for. And that's the way it should be. Uh, why alienate half uh, your audience? President Ford is considering an income tax cut for people in lower tax brackets. That's, that's the good news. Now, the bad news is he still hasn't figured out how they can get an income. <laughs> Finally, some good political news. Bill Clinton has laryngitis, lost his voice. <laughs> and I do have a late breaking news bulletin for you. World War III was just declared. No, no, I'm, I'm just kidding, of course, not really. <laughs> I just wanted to get Reagan out of bed to watch the monologue. <laughs> Everybody wants to be loved, no matter what they do. Everybody wants to feel that somebody likes them, they're accepted. It's an attention-getting thing. And that, in effect, is like saying, hey, look at me, folks, I'm, I'm getting your acceptance. So it is a form of love, I think, you're looking for from the audience. And I'm sure that that's part of it. To any performer, is that they like me. The 
it was an illusion. He, he created an illusion. Now, beneath the illusion, there was this very decent Midwestern guy with all those sensibilities that you saw. Everything you saw was true. That wasn't a fake guy. He wasn't lying. That was him. But it wasn't all of him. Look at him on the camera. He's, he's smiling. He's friendly. But look, look again. He's, he's standing backward. He's, he's, he's pushed back. He doesn't want you to get near to him. His whole life is to keep you away from him and to create this illusion, the illusion that was part of his magic tricks. You're out there every night, and it's either acceptance or rejection. And I think that is a psychological burden. And even if you're great and you've been consistently great, you know, there could come a time when the audience just doesn't laugh. And if they don't laugh, you've failed. It's amazingly stressful. It's a lot of pressure. And at the end of the day, you're very tired. And you go to bed and start all over again. He loved the danger of it. It's Russian roulette, you know. You, you go out and you hope the bullet isn't in the chamber. And, <laughs> and when you get through, you go, the bullet wasn't in the chamber this time. Keep your hands off me, you pervert. <laughs> I'm spoken for. Aunt Blabby, it's very nice to see you again. Thank you, Bozo. Would you mind breathing in the other direction? You're melting my car keys. <laughs> in addition to hosting the show, Johnny appeared in sketches and also created a stable of unforgettable characters, characters through which he could disappear and engage in a more daring brand of humor. Friends, while your car is being serviced, we... We provide you with a set of wheels. I'm just talking totally. <laughs> At Tune-Up Manglers, we adjust your gap, steam clean your chassis, lube your joints, and clean your points. And if you like our work, bring in your car. The thing about Johnny was, he managed to be sort of an everyman kind of a character, but he also was really hip. You know, there was a, there was a hipness to his approach and his, and his humor that appealed even to people who are into comedy you know, really into serious comedy. They also watched Johnny and marveled at how he could do it. A losing streak. A losing streak. <laughs> Describe a man running naked after chugging prune juice. <laughs> that is, to me, the greatest sleight of hand that Johnny Carson performed in his career, was appearing to be broad and silly and somehow coming off as the coolest guy in the room. No idea how he does it. Since his divorce from Joanne, Johnny began dating 31-year-old ex-model Joanna Holland, a well-traveled and sophisticated divorcee who enjoyed a jet-set lifestyle. She drew the private Carson out in the world. But Johnny did not see her exclusively, continuing to play the field. His attraction to women was also part of his on-camera persona, and the feeling was mutual. He would get mail, as often these guys do, all kinds of nude Polaroids and things like that. He was a sex symbol. And he would find the double entendre, and he would wink at you, and he wouldn't oversell it. But he was doing something nobody else was doing on television. Just look at your house and your shrubs. It sometimes is rather embarrassing. I'd love to see your shrubs. <laughs> I Have you ever hit anybody? I know you. I'm sorry for that. I, any opening at all, I jump right in. Um, uh oh. You... Now, wait, now, wait a minute. Wait. So there was always this aura of, ooh, something kind of cool, kind of naughty, something we're not supposed to know about is happening at 11:30. Come on. Dinner for two. His look, his innocence, allowed him to get away with a great deal. People are always uh, asking if they're real and... Oh, I, no, I would uh, never. I would I never, you see. No, you don't have to ask. I would not I'll tell you what, these are my... I have certain guidelines on the show. <laughs> uh, I usually... But I would give about a year's pay to peek under there. <laughs> we got too comfortable together. You, f you get to forgetting that there's a camera and an audience out there and you get cozy with each other and say things you, you really should not be saying, but too late. <laughs> Wanna go to party night with just low lights and... Uh... <laughs> I shouldn't do that. Now, why am I flirting with you? I'm, I'm, I'm a married man. You know, and people saying, hey, I'm sitting here flirting. 
You're not flirting. You're making funny statements. I wish you were flirting. <laughs> Johnny Carson, along with Hugh Hefter, I think are the forefathers of the sexual revolution in America. Johnny was the first naughty boy on television. He was handsome. How many handsome, funny guys are there? This guy was like a matinee idol, good looking guy. Johnny Carson had his own clothes. I'd read that. When you watch him every night, different suit. In the ghetto, that's important, that you sharp every night. Johnny was like the board of health every night clean, and that excited me. I simply believe when a man is well-dressed, you just aren't aware of his clothes. I wear the suit. It doesn't wear me. If you agree with this philosophy, I'd like you to take a look at the totally coordinated Johnny Carson collection for spring. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here. Well, the Here's Johnny happened because Dad was thinking and thinking, what could he do to make it different? How could he announce him to really put a mark on that show? And it just came out. He, he thought of it, and he tried it, and it became a piece of history, as they say. If you couldn't figure out how to be an adult male in this country in those years by watching those two guys, you were hopeless. I mean, that was it. You know, these are the two guys you and your buddy wanted to be if you ever got to go to a cocktail party. I mean, that relationship, you know, Big Ed, who ought to know better and is pretending he doesn't, and Johnny, the, the smarter, better looking, funnier of the two, I guess it's classic, similar Laurel and Hardy kind of a thing. Everybody bought into them. That's my favorite guy, and there's his best friend, and they're hanging out together. I do believe I'll drink to that. I thought you would, yes. <laughs> Once Dad and Johnny got this reputation, oh, we're drinking buddies, people send drinks over all night long. They don't even know what they're drinking. They're just there having a good time, eating, laughing, talking to people. And when you're not buying your own drink, you could have 10 drinks and think you're having two. You just don't know. Well, if he had a few, I, I think it's good to have a cop around. <laughs> It wasn't Ed that had the drinking problem, it was Johnny. And it was Ed that would go out with Johnny at night and, and when he'd become belligerent and violent as he did after too many drinks, Ed would be the one that would take him home. The next day he would show up, no hangover, bright, cheery, gung-ho, ready to go. Why don't we uh... <laughs> do that? Stop <laughs> They had a love-hate relationship. They understood how important each of them was to the other on the show. But Johnny sometimes felt that Ed was too intrusive when Johnny was doing a piece of material. Ed was almost dropped more than uh, once. In fact, I had to go to Ed at one time and say, your humor is good, but don't overshadow uh, Johnny's humor. My next guest doesn't really need an introduction, but my what? Your first guest. What did I say? My next guest. Well, he's my next guest. Oh. <laughs> it's also happens to be your first guest. That's right. Yes. It's uh, could be either one, first and next. Yes. Which is it? It's my. It's, it's, actually, it's my first and uh, next guest. Yeah. You had to be good, but not too good. You didn't want to look like you were trying to get the boss's job. So I bite my lip many nights on the show because I think of something and I don't say it, and Johnny says it. So we're linked together, but it's his job to say it, not mine. Though Johnny teased him incessantly, only once in all their years together did Ed appear on the show intoxicated. At a luncheon earlier in the day, he had one too many martinis. You, you really think you're fooling everybody, don't no, you? No, 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 no. Uh, and she I'm also... I'm just here to do my best to help you. I know that. And she does her three horse shows a day, did you know that? At the Animal Park. Boy. What? What an exciting idea. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like an army cutter or something? Maybe just to kind of catch up on a little, no, nap, no, no, little no. nappy poo? Just might no, snap no, no, you no. right out of it. Okay. I love Joan. I'm the only one who went down to see Joan. Doc has never seen her. You've never seen her. 
I went to the it's wild animal farm. It's all right, it's all right. It's okay. But you're upsetting it's, me. No, you're upsetting no. Me. I don't want to upset you. I went down, Joan, and I I know you it. did. That's all right. It's all right. Don't say... No. What? That I don't... I know her. I went down there. Oh, I know you did. I, I, I know you went down there. And I held a I baby could, gorilla. I couldn't go with you that week. You held a baby gorilla. Yeah. Good, all right. And uh, let's get her out here quickly. Would you welcome John Embry? Johnny was far more refined in a way and, you know, had special friends that he would play cards with. And, and maybe they just outgrew each other a little bit because in the beginning they hung out so much together that it's like having a best friend in grade school. And as you go to high school and college, you know, you meet other friends that you might have more in common with. Johnny grew up loving big band music, and The Tonight Show Ensemble was considered one of the best in the business. Leader Doc Severinsen began his tenure quietly and conservatively. Over time, that changed. And Johnny had a way of putting words in your mouth. I mean, you know, he could start up a conversation with you. That is the bluest coat. I've seen blue coats, but that thing is alive. <laughs> The salmon pants, yes. right? And they're swimming upstream. <laughs> <laughs> and when they get there, they're gonna die. <laughs> we thought we were developing ourselves, but Johnny was developing us. Johnny made us who we were. You can come over there. Would you like to come to the house? And uh, this is the first time you've ever asked me. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you made me feel so guilty. I mean, I mean, you and you ask an employee in front of 15 million people, do you want to come to the house for Thanksgiving? Dinner? What am I going to say? No. <laughs> you know what I say? I say, yes, Mr. Carson, I love it. <laughs> Can you come? No. <laughs> We are very pleased to welcome you here as our very special guests to celebrate Johnny Carson's completion of 10 consecutive years as the star of The Tonight Show on NBC. In a rare display of network respect for its biggest asset, Johnny took the occasion to make a surprise announcement. I, uh... It's very difficult to hide things in this town. So I think it's only fair to tell you tonight that we were married at 1.30 this afternoon. My apologies to the press for not informing you beforehand. But sometimes you like to do those things kind of quietly. And she certainly could have been one of the great ladies of Los Angeles. And they could have been the kind of king and queen of Los Angeles social life if they wanted to, if Johnny had allowed it. But he didn't want that. Everybody wanted a piece of him. And I think that he just couldn't take it anymore. And he just had to shut himself off to survive. You just can't say yes to everyone. Imagine yourself being the fish in the fishbowl at the party, which Johnny was. Go up to Johnny, see what Johnny like, go up to Johnny, you know? So I think it's unfair to judge him at a party. By the way, I'm no fun at a party, and I'm really likable. There was a time when... Uh... I used to have a little pop, I sure did. That's right. I don't handle it well. You and McM... Really, you don't? I don't handle alcohol well at all, no. Really don't. Oh, Ed and I have uh, had some wonderful times in the past. You know what Ed told us? What did Ed tell you? <laughs> he told us that from time to time, you were going to take on the whole Russian army, and you didn't have the bazookas to do it. That's right. No, that's uh, one reason I found that it was probably best for me to not really entangle with it. Rather than a lot of people who become fun-loving and gregarious and love everybody, uh, I would go the opposite. And it would happen just like that. When we'd be out, I would see this go out with one person and come home with somebody who was completely different in temperament. 
and it got to be very difficult. And uh, we discussed it, we worked it out, and I think it's something that he's finally said to himself, I'm not gonna let that get the better of me or my life or my marriage. But drinking would remain an issue off and on for the rest of his life. In 1982, Carson was arrested for driving under the influence. A breath test showed an alcohol level of 0.16, well above the legal limit. Here's some sad show business news. <laughs> it, was an, it was an announcement. <laughs> You'll like it when I struggle, don't you? You really love that. Okay. The general rule is never acknowledge that a joke bombed. But he developed a certain <laughs> artistry about it, and people really started liking the jokes more when they bombed. Exactly what time was it I went bad? <laughs> I knew it was going to come to one of these nights when they were going to turn against me, so I came prepared for tonight. There's a uh, little fly flying around. Probably from the mold off of one of those jokes I told. And, and what he did, the tool that he had that I don't have and I've not seen anybody else uh, come close to is when things were not going well, he would rise above that and, and become a, a whole other uh, entertaining entity. You see kids out here, especially in California, Beverly Hills, have it rough. Father's Day could mean, what, four or five gifts? That's right. <laughs> see, most Beverly Hills... <laughs> You're always raised as a kid, you know, that you should be modest. But unfortunately, in the entertainment business, that does not work. If you don't have a certain amount of ego, now that doesn't mean a cocksureness. It means a confidence in your own ability. That I know what I do, I do it well, and when I walk in front of an audience, I know that I am good. If you don't have that attitude, you shouldn't be out there. By the late 1970s, NBC languished in the ratings. The Tonight Show was a rare bright spot, bringing in nearly 20% of the network's total income. But newly installed President Fred Silverman chastised Johnny Carson publicly. And he targeted Johnny, which had never been done before. And basically, he felt like Johnny although still you know, doing well and bringing in a lot of money, was taking off so much time. He didn't work on Mondays, he took so many weeks off, that he tried to pressure Johnny, which throughout Johnny's history was a major mistake. You just didn't take this guy on. He had a steel backbone. There was one scene in Jaws where a network executive went swimming and the shark circled around him and then left him alone. <laughs> Professional courtesy. <laughs> And so there was a contentious relationship between the uh, two of them. Once again, Johnny was wary of network executives, and network executives come and go, and Johnny didn't want someone else telling him what to do. Johnny Carson asking to get off The Tonight Show is roughly equal to George Washington asking to get off the $1 bill. After 17 years, I'm, I'm getting a little tired of it. I don't, know, thank I, I don't think I can bring anything new to it, and uh, it gets a little tougher all the time to do it. And uh, I want to keep the standard of the show up. And uh, I feel if I go too long, I won't be able to do that. What is your goal in life? Yeah. You want to tell them? Uh, to be a good person, a worthy citizen, and to rip NBC off for everything they've got. <laughs> it's always going to be a tricky marriage, art and commerce. It's always going to be fraught with tension. It just is. It's built into the system. That's what happens. You know, we've. We haven't all been there, but <laughs> I think we have. To do battle with the network, Carson enlisted his longtime attorney, Henry Bushkin. He had become Johnny's most trusted advisor and friend, serving also as his tennis partner and psychotherapist. Bushkin and NBC engaged in one of the most protracted and expensive negotiations in television history. The result? A three-year deal where Johnny would do four shows a week, be paid well over $5 million a year, and own The Tonight Show library. He'd produce all future episodes, which would be cut from 90 minutes to one hour. The most powerful star in television 
got everything he wanted. We have a sign that rivals the sign on the Goodyear blimp that says applause, right? That's on the audience side. Over here, I have one that says fake humility. Johnny was an anarchist in many ways. There's the wonderful story of his going to the polo lounge at the Beverly Hills Hotel and being asked by the maitre d' to put on a necktie. Johnny put on a used necktie that was there for that purpose, but took off his shoes and socks since there was no regulation about going into the polo lounge barefooted until he, of course, did it. Though some critics had grown tired of Johnny's formula jokes, Carson continued to reign supreme over the late night landscape, anointing the next stars in the world of stand-up comedy. I'm glad that you're all in a good mood tonight because it's always a pleasure to introduce a new comedian to the Tonight Show. This young man's name is Jay Leno. Your first Tonight Show is like your first girlfriend. It, you're not very good, it's over very quickly, and you just want to do it again. It's, it's that kind of thing. But I remember being more nervous watching it at night than I was actually at the time doing it. You ever see that commercial where the husband is so insecure, can't even tell his wife she makes a terrible cup of coffee? Hmm? <laughs> More coffee, honey? I uh, no thanks, dear. I think I'll just get an apartment downtown. It was a testing ground. It was a firing range. And if you could go in there, and I remember uh, being nervous as hell. The baby's crawling around on the carpet, and this baby uh, loads up his diaper, you know? and. Uh... <laughs> I'm sitting there, you know, and the mother comes over and says, isn't that adorable? Brandon made a gift for daddy. <laughs> now I'm figuring this guy's gotta be real easy to shop for on Father. Curtain opens, you know, Johnny Carson introduces me, the curtain opens, and it's just like I dreamed it. It's just exactly like I dreamed it. I go on a stage, I hit the mark. Then he says my favorite thing on the menu, it's a hot dog with cheese and bacon. Yeah, not enough nitrates in a hot dog. I gotta put some bacon on top of there. <laughs> and for an extra dollar, they'll put chili on top of the whole thing. For people who don't care anymore. I remember seeing Johnny Carson holding onto the desk. He's holding onto the desk because he's laughing so hard so he doesn't fall off the chair. Because he's like, he's like convulsing. That's the kind of food just marches right down your throat, you know? <laughs> Follow me, boys. We're going to the heart. <laughs> he goes, like this. And I go, who, me? And he goes, yeah, you. And I, I'm like, oh, no, nobody gets called over for the Tonight Show. That's a big thing. It's like a religious experience. And then after that, my career was made. You're <laughs> funny as hell. Thanks, I appreciate that. You Thank really you really are. Thanks. Uh, oh, you too. <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> it was the stamp of approval. It was. Johnny Carson says, you're funny. Johnny Carson says, you're good. And a million people could tell you they like you, but if Johnny didn't like you, I think that would have a huge impact on, on your ego. That's very, that's very clever and very fresh, and... Uh... Well, that's wonderful hearing that from you. No, Thank I mean you. it. It's good material. <laughs> Thank you. And so that's, that was the beginning of... of uh, he changed my life. You jump up a notch in the business as far as working, your income tripled. You, you were validated right away. In the middle of the night, I am now the automatic noise checker-outer. <laughs> yes. Every little, oh, what was that? No, nothing, go sleep. No, check it out! What do you mean, sleep? Getting one of these from Johnny was one of the greatest things in, in my career, you know? Jerry Seinfeld. Thank you, Jerry. Think about it. The truth is, I still think about it, you know, because you sat there and you went, this is some kind of magic place. My folks are moving to Florida. Uh, they don't want to move to Florida, but they're in their 60s, and that's the law. <laughs> <laughs> Long Island. You're, I think you evicted from Long Island, aren't yeah, you, 60? They, they have like a leisure police of some kind. <laughs> get the golf clubs and get in the van, folks. You know, There's just not that many moments of life that are that definitive of a before and an after life, you know? Before you're wanting to be a comedian and after you are one. You know, the one thing I'll never, well, ever this happens to everybody, that the kind of thing I'll always remember as long as I live, growing up in Indiana, is when dad used to tease me with the power tools. How many of you? <laughs> Did you have <laughs> What a guy. What a guy. Sense of humor. Yeah. It takes weeks or months for the adrenaline to drain out of your system because here it is, it's The Tonight Show, and, and you've gotten laughs. 
and you get to sit down with Johnny Carson, that's the end of the world. That, that's just it. I mean, if, if nothing more had happened for me, I could always get a free beer in any bar in the country telling that story. The most important thing to me, I think, is the empathy that you have to have for the performer. I think this is the greatest thing that a performer can have if he's going to be successful as an entertainer is an empathy with the audience. They have to like him. They have to like him. And if they like the performer, then you've got 80% of it made. And he'll laugh. If you laugh at him, he'll usually <laughs> laugh. Will he laugh for you? I think that's why people liked him with the animals, is because it would show this deeply sweet, almost childlike, playful side that he had. And that's when you would, it would peek out. This is a thing that really makes you love a performer. You see, if you look an animal right in the face and talk to him, you, you'd say, then you know, you're not scared. The viewers really were experiencing through Johnny vicariously what it would be like to be in his shoes, to be, you know, standing there next to that animal. And he became part of them. So I reached up to pick up the marmoset. They mark their territory. So they leave urine scent on the branches, and it marked its territory. Was that? Was he spitting? Was that saliva? <laughs> In the same scenario, probably with other hosts, nothing would have come of it. It was not just the animal but it was the spontaneity and, and his response to the situation that made that segment. Johnny spent his 56th birthday filming a TV special where he returned to his hometown of Norfolk, Nebraska. Surprising him were his sister Catherine, brother Dick, and wife Joanna. Though they had all smiles for the camera, by now, he and Joanna had already separated once. Because I think if you've gone through divorce once, mm -hmm. I don't know how people go through it more than once. I really. <laughs> he was the first guy to sort of normalize divorce because he was divorced three times in the course of his tenure. In 1983, for reasons including irreconcilable differences and adultery, Joanna Carson sought one of the biggest paydays in the history of American divorce court to date. After a two-year battle played out in the tabloid press, she received a settlement upwards of $20 million. I remember when I was a little teeny kid, seven or eight, Babe Ruth, my hero. Then when I first got into show business, Jack Benny was my hero. You know, they changed. Now it, my hero is Henry VIII. <laughs> Johnny believed Joanna to be uh, the love of his life. And I've heard that from a lot of people. There was something to it. Again, not a faithful husband to her, but there was something very, very deep there. So I called him up and you know said, how are you doing? And uh, he said, would you come over after the show? He said, I, I don't want to be alone. He said, you know, because there were um, he said, you know, there were good times, too, you know. Not too many people saw that side of Johnny, but, um, yeah, he was hurt. He was hurting. You could probably find something unpleasant in all humor if you dig far enough. If you do a joke about divorce, obviously, if you dig under the surface, divorce is unpleasant. It's painful. Broken marriages, drunkenness, alcoholism. There's pain and tragedy there. I suppose if you laid any joke open, you could find something unpleasant underneath. My personal life has been exactly like this year's Academy Awards. It uh, started off with terms of endearment. I thought I had the right stuff. It uh, cost a lot to dress her. Then came the big chill. In the past month, I've been begging for tender mercies. At the peak of his power, Johnny Carson hosted the Academy Awards five times, making him one of the most popular MCs in the history of the show. But this most private of public figures felt the pressure of being on the world stage. It was a very tough 
industry audience. He was from television. He wasn't from the movies. He didn't want to force comedy on people right down to the last minute of the four hours. I think he was the greatest. And when I hosted the first time, I completely modeled my performance on his, which was this. Open up, you do 10 minutes of the best jokes you can find and get out of the way. Now, a lot of people who come to these affairs try to act blasé, and I'll have to be very honest with you, I am very thrilled to stand up here tonight and gaze out on this glorious throng of beautiful people. I see a lot of new faces, especially on the old faces. <laughs> In 1983, Joan Rivers was named the first permanent guest host of The Tonight Show. The appointment reflected how much Johnny Carson loved the woman he had long considered a close friend, among the few who had earned his trust. Yeah, it's, it's been a long time, you and me. Yes, yeah. well, people are starting to talk. You look just as good as ever. <clears throat> so do you. Thank you. <laughs> I must say publicly, you always compliment me on this show telling you that you owe so much to The Tonight Show and so forth. To like, you, not I, to The Tonight Show, I, to you. But in 1986, Joan Rivers knew this would be her last appearance with the man that launched her career. That night, she wore the same dress from her 1965 debut. I saved it all, because you know it was such a big night for me. Yeah. I put, I'm wearing the same underwear, which everyone backstage remembers. <laughs> At that point, she'd already been talking with Fox and already had a deal for a show of her own. But what she didn't do was tell him long before. The night before she announced that she was starting a show on Fox at a press conference, Johnny got wind of that because she never went to Johnny and said, hey, I've got this wonderful opportunity and I hope I have your blessings, but I wanted you to know. She never did that. She never, ever mentioned it. And of course, everybody double crosses everybody in this business. And somehow it was leaked. And I called him, first phone call. And I said, Johnny, and he had obviously heard. And he hung up on me. He was furious with her. And I think rightfully so. And that was it. He never spoke to me again. He took it as a complete betrayal. And I look back, and I think maybe I should have just gone and asked him. It was that simple, but she just didn't do it after all the loyalty he showed her, it was a terrible decision. I don't say this so you feel uh, like I'm bragging. I don't worry about money anymore because I have a fantastic business advisor, shrewd man, bombastic Bushkin. <laughs> He's got me into some shrewd business deals. I have an all-night liquor store in a Mormon temple. <laughs> I own a Fredericks of Hollywood in Iran. <laughs> I'm not into gold or precious metals. Bushkin told me to buy flint. <laughs> Carson may have joked about it, but the fact was that by the late 1980s, he believed Henry Bushkin had indeed gotten him into some bad investments. Moreover, he felt Bushkin had enriched himself at Johnny's expense. Johnny enjoyed loyalty and gave loyalty. But once you crossed him, and you were not the person you proposed to be, that was it, finish. He felt betrayed by Mr. Bushkin, and if he felt betrayed and that there was no loyalty, then it was over. So he, he cut it off immediately. He had had people in his life he trusted that were ultimately untrustworthy. His world became narrower and narrower as he went along The Tonight Show and got bigger and bigger and bigger. No matter how important you think you are or how much press you get, mothers especially are always able to kind of level it real good. Remember when I got the Governor's Award from the Television Academy in 1980, and I called my mother. I said, Mom, they're giving me the, the Governor's Award. You know, it's for your body of work in, in the television industry. And my mother said, I guess they know what they're doing. <laughs> Ruth Carson died in 1985 at the age of 84. Workers cleaning out her Arizona home discovered a box filled with hundreds of newspaper and magazine clippings 
dating back to the beginning of her son's career. Johnny kept the box in his bedroom closet for the rest of his life. He remained angry at his mother in ways and also adored her and sought her love and approval till the day she died. But it's very conflicting, and I don't know how much of that transferred into his inability to be a faithful husband. It did affect his relationship with women tremendously. I don't think he hated women, but I think he was careful to trust them. And when he did, they got his entire trust. Everybody knows I love you, and that's nice. Well, when and you say love, now what do you mean? I mean, I'm, I mean, you have an affection for me. I have more than an affection for you. I love you, and I like you a lot. <laughs> He was just terrific. We just never got in the right slot, you know? Missed being uh, free at the same time. By the time we caught up with each other, we were re-involved or something, and never got really serious. Johnny approached 33-year-old Alexis Moss as she walked on the sand in front of his Carbon Beach home. He invited her in for a glass of wine. Soon, she traveled with him to Wimbledon and the south of France, his constant companion. Look, you have to admit, I, uh, I keep coming back for more, as I said to the Justice of the Peace. <laughs> Though he told her numerous times during their three-year courtship that he'd never marry again, in 1987, in a private ceremony at his Malibu home, Alex became the fourth Mrs. Carson. Johnny always felt I think because of his Nebraska upbringing, that he needed to be married. And I know that they, they were madly in love and they were meant for each other. And so I think that it, she filled a missing piece. I don't think he felt so isolated. I think he felt a true partner in Alex and he seemed to be extremely happy. I think what he found as sometimes older powerful men find with younger wives he came to her fully formed, and she had to accept him as he was. It's, he was very much not a public persona in his private time, and she seemed to accept all that in him. And I think their marriage thrived to some degree because of that for a while, until I believe even that wore on her. I think he regretted he didn't have a closer relationship with his sons than he did. And I think his sons probably felt that too, but he really loved them. Every time he talked about any of them, he would well up with emotion. And he was very proud of all of them. Johnny's relationship to his three adult sons remained distant. He supported them all, giving them just enough to live comfortably. In 1991, middle son Rick was killed when his car plunged off a cliff along the California coast. So first of all, I want to thank all of you who were so very thoughtful and compassionate and sympathetic with your letters. It meant a great deal to me, and I know it meant a great deal to Rick's brothers, Chris and Corey, and our entire family. And Johnny, incidentally, was never the same ever after that. This is where I live. But for Johnny, career had remained his top priority. At the age of 63, he would be challenged by a new late night host that his network saw as a real threat. You know, I think Arsenio Hall was the first competitor who came on the horizon that gave NBC the shakes. And I think it really worried them, it shook them, because there was a sense that there's a party going on at the Ar Arsenio show you, you can't miss. The best way to compete against Johnny is to find your own niche, find your own genre, and try to coexist with him. My idea was Johnny has this thing that no one can touch. Maybe I can have the kids of that demographic. Maybe I can have the children of Johnny's audience. That's the key. Don't compete. Find what's uniquely yours. Eventually, I mean, it's going to end like everything ends. Nothing lasts forever. Everybody has their their time on television, and you go on to do something else. I don't, it's never been chiseled in stone tablets, you know, that I've got to do this till I die at the desk. Uh, 
I don't want to end that way. In 1991, well into his 29th year as host of The Tonight Show, Johnny realized his world was changing. Guest host Jay Leno's manager planted a story in the press that NBC wanted Leno to replace Carson sooner rather than later. Johnny was furious. There was a sense, I think, that he got a feeling NBC was, was manipulating him out. Well, there, there had been a lot of negativity in the air. It just wore him down, and he felt that he was becoming, uh, he was, that NBC wasn't doing enough to protect him. I don't think he trusted anybody at the end. Maybe four people were able to come in to his world, but he got so, um, everybody wanted a piece of him, and he just became more and more and more remote. Uh, we'll pick it up from it, I'll pull it around. Yes. In May of 1991, before a meeting of network affiliates, Johnny Carson surprised everyone by announcing that he'd retire the following year. This time, he meant it. NBC never, ever consulted Johnny as to who should be the next host after him. That really hurt him because he had a very good relationship with Bob Wright. I talked to him a couple of times about it. Um, he, he did not want to get involved in a direct manner in that issue. He didn't, he said, listen, I've had this show, I do this show, I don't manage NBC's affairs, I just manage my own. You know, you guys will have to make the right decision yourself. I think that David is a terrific comic. I think he would do very well in the position. If you're gonna get him to go there, that's gonna work just fine. I felt strongly that Jay Leno was the appropriate person. Jay Leno had, at that point, been the permanent guest host of The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson for several years, had been doing it very successfully. Before, before we start tonight, I want to tell young Jay Leno, I've changed my mind, I'm gonna stay. <laughs> Johnny was always very gracious. He was always very nice. There was tension, and then over the years, we got to be friends again, and. We would talk occasionally, not a whole lot, because Johnny was a private person. Plus, you always have that odd situation of anytime you invoke Johnny's name, are you doing it for your own self-aggrandizement? Just how pissed off are you? <laughs> you, you keep using language like that. <laughs> and you're going to find yourself out of a job. <laughs> I do everything the hard way, and that was hard. But I think, honestly, it had the, the, the better outcome for me personally. Another day, another $2 million. <laughs> you know, the buildup to the final show during the last four weeks was not to be believed. Monologue, of course. Bob Hope. One of the, the problems you have with a talk show like this is trying to book people. But well, we had to turn people away. Everybody wanted to do The Tonight Show with Johnny. Everybody wanted to be on one more time. Why do you have to do this? Why do you have to quit? <laughs> <laughs> Don't go! <laughs> the set, which I assume you're dismantling and setting up at your house. <laughs> because... It's easier to talk to people like this, isn't it? Yes, it is. Don't, don't you wish when you had a guest over, you could just say, we're out of time. <laughs> I said, Johnny, when I go out doing concerts, it's like huge, the response. People are not ready for you to leave. And he said, you know, I've always prided myself on my sense of timing. And this is the time to go. Raise our goblets, hoist our glasses. On May 22nd, we're out on our asses. <laughs> He had seen people who stayed too long, and he had made the decision to leave when he was on top, and he did, and uh, he never looked back and never really regretted it. I talked to him about it later, and he said, I just don't have the energy that I used to have for this show. It's a very hard thing for a comedian who lives on applause and laughter more than anything else. That is your nutrition, that is your diet that you're always looking forward to, when am I going to get my next feeding? 
but he didn't need to be in front of the audience anymore. He didn't have that need. He really wanted a quiet, private life. He wanted to make his life simple. Johnny told me that he didn't want to be like George Burns, whose manager propped him up in a chair in his late 90s. He said, why not be remembered for your work in the old days? He, he felt he had done his 30 years, and that was enough. More than anything, I think people accepted the fact that it was the end of an era, but I also think they felt like this is a friend of ours that we're not going to see anymore. You know, this is someone who's been in our lives that we're not going to see anymore. And so it was, it was moving. You people watching, I can only tell you that it has been an honor and a privilege to come into your homes all these years and entertain you. And I hope when I find something that I want to do and I think you will like and come back that you'll be as gracious inviting me into your home as you have been. I bid you a very heartfelt good night. And when it was over, it was, it was, and forgive me if this is melodramatic, but it's like watching a relative fade off from a coma to the other world. It was, you know, the screen goes black and the television is off and Johnny's gone. You know, for my entire career, I've heard comedians in bars debate over who do you think is going to get the Tonight Show after Johnny leaves? What nobody realized is that when you left, you were going to pack it up and take it with you, which is what he did, because that show never existed again. There never was a Tonight Show. It was Carson. And people would come up to him on a, you know, a weekly basis and say, we miss you so much. You know, you are so important to us. And, you know, he would say, you can't get any better than that. Can't beat that. One of America's greatest television personalities, Johnny Carson left the Nebraska Plains to reside over late night TV for almost 30 years. The United States honors Johnny Carson, who personifies the heart and humor of America. Johnny was pitched numerous projects in retirement, but didn't pursue any of them. He knew he could never top what he'd done, and that was just fine with him. Though offered countless awards, he accepted only those he could not refuse. The closest he came to working again was to fax jokes to his friend, David Letterman. Johnny was so proud. He would call me and say, did you see? He used three of my jokes last night. And he was like a kid all over again, saying, I love hearing my jokes on the air again. Johnny Carson made his last appearance on television when he delivered a top 10 list to Letterman. He received a 90-second standing ovation. We went to Africa, and he learned to speak Swahili. We got over there, we're in Tanzania, and there's Johnny talking to the guy driving the truck, talking to the guy at the airport, trying to see if it's really good. Do they understand me? Getting more confident. We're way out in the Serengeti, and you know he would be talking about elephants or something, and they'd be laughing and, you know, and daring him to do things. And all I know is he was talking, and they were laughing. <laughs> Amazing. That's a gift. More and more, Johnny retreated behind the gates of his Malibu home overlooking the Pacific Ocean. He continued to play tennis, remained an avid reader, and spent long hours sitting outside gazing at the sea. Friends said that Johnny was never more content than when he was alone on the water, as far away from humanity as possible. In later years, he even saw less of his wife, Alex. And there was almost an understanding that they were kind of living a slightly separate life. But she understood him, and he understood her, and I guess they were just fine with that. I think I also heard that he said, I don't want to be known as a guy who got divorced four times. 
we went out, dropped anchor, and thought it'd be a nice time for a swim. And Johnny was a very athletic, very strong guy. And he didn't swim any more than a few strokes. And, and he come, came up for air, and he said, wow, I'm out of breath already. And you could see he was alarmed about it. it Might have been the first time that he had a wake-up call that he had emphysema. Johnny was one of those people who sincerely believed that he had an immunity against the ills of smoking and that he had fooled himself into believing that he was one of those people that smoking would never harm. He had stopped smoking at that time, but uh, I don't think he was too thrilled about the fact that he caused the situation and uh, knew that he did that. But I think he was, he was covering up. He wasn't letting us know just how sick he was. And when he got ill, he called me because he, he knew I was a smoker. And the last thing uh, he said to me was, um, these damn cigarettes. And I said, I know, John. Here's that rainy day they told me about. And I laughed. That it might turn out this way. I think Johnny himself was content and at peace with it. And uh, he didn't want to live a compromised life on oxygen tanks. That wasn't who he was. But he did wish to go at that point. He didn't. He, he didn't want to fight. Funny how love becomes a cold rainy day. Funny that rainy day is here. So we interrupt this program. That was it. Johnny Carson died on January 23rd, 2005. He was 79 years old. I could not believe how stunned I was the day Johnny died, and I happened to be renting a place in Malibu from which I could look right across what is actually called Paradise Cove to where Johnny's house was. I, I, I just sat out there. <laughs> I sat out there for like an hour. You go, uh, and you go, like, you know, I, I'm not that, I'm not that close to that guy. And then I realized how close I was. In fact, when he passed away, uh, I read a story in the Omaha Herald, of, uh, and they had a listing of all the things that he had donated to, and I only knew a few of them. It was amazing. He would just do it. He would see a story about someone in need and pick up the phone and, and write a check all the time. And he never said anything to anybody about it. So there he is in the end with the largest charitable foundation of probably anybody that's ever been in the entertainment business. And nobody knew. And that was the most intimate relationship probably between viewer and star in all of television because of that hour and his role in soothing you at the end of your day. And we can go on and get up in the morning and it'll be all right and here we go again. And it was so important and what he did there, nobody has ever touched. You're a policeman, you're a nurse, you're a fireman, you're someone who deals with tragedy. You come home at night, you turn on the TV, you just wanna have a laugh. 
he never brought you down to, oh, here's what's going on. Oh, my life is so horrible. He, he always elevated everybody up, and I think that was the key. You felt good after watching the show. I said, Johnny, I'm mad at you. I think a lot of us are mad at you who have to do this for a living now because you lulled us into doing it by making it look so easy. Johnny Carson coalesced my life. He gave me something to aim for, some, something to emulate. Well, that's not gonna happen, but you know, you gotta have a target. You gotta have something to shoot for. He put me together as a person, honestly. Um, so I forget the question, but <laughs> that's the answer. <laughs> We're drinking, my friend, to the end of a sweet episode. I would say it would probably be Professor Hoffman's Book of Magic. That would be the Rosebud, the first magic book he ever picked up. And he decided, huh, what's this? A way to transform himself into something else something bigger, something that would impress and yet quietly do it, elegantly do it. Magic, magic is his rosebud. For all of the years, for the laughs, for the tears, for the class that you showed, make it one for my baby and one more for the road that long long road Sis Boom Ba. Sis Boom Ba. <laughs> Describe the sound made when a sheep explodes. <laughs> Thank you.